slide. Okay. Uh, this is Phil Simberg for the Backgammon Learning Center. And uh, as you can see from the picture, we had a great chouette yesterday. Uh, the six players, I think many people know a lot of these players, David Rockwell, myself, Carter Maddig. Uh, might not know Ralph. He doesn't play in tournaments too much, but he's been playing for about 50 years at our chouette. David Stein's a relatively new player. Herb Roman, who is probably the best player in the world that's played, uh, that's never won a tournament in my opinion, uh, but he comes close and he's a fine player. So we're all open players and I'll play a pretty decent game, but something really funny happened on Saturday, which uh, yesterday, we all made horrible blunders, a lot of them. Usually we'll make a few mistakes, we'll have a few bets, but yesterday we really blew it. We had so, just about every position that we disagreed on, somebody blundered, and I'm not about to name who blundered on what, but because these positions were such big differences in the plays, and because I think they're also fun and interesting positions, and by the way, there were another 10 positions that I didn't bother to show because they were close and they weren't that interesting. I, I called in Stick, who was my teaching partner for the Back Ammon Learning Center. Been, we've been together now, it's been close to 10 years maybe, and uh, we have 16 teachers, including Mochi and Michi. Stick is now ranked the number four player in the world as far as his PR. Uh, on recorded live matches by the BMAB, and I figured Stick can explain what's really going on with these positions. I'll give you a little background of what happened. So let's get right into it. The first position, uh, there's a 2-2 two -two to play, and I'm, I'll be honest with you, I, I missed this one. Uh, first of all, you can pause the video if you want more time before you hear, see the answer and hear what Stick's explanation of what the right play is. But I saw a lot of plays here, and that's the problem when I see lots of different plays. I, I get sidetracked and confused, and I made the wrong play. So, what would you do? Again, you can pause the video, and if not, the spoiler is I'm going to show you the answer, and we'll see how you did. You can keep track of how you did on these 15, and shoot me an email. I'd love to know how you did, and we'll see what Stick has to say about it. So, Stick, first of all, I want you to be real honest. Are there any of these 15 positions that, in a short, you might have missed yourself? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, good. And, I, and I'm not embarrassed to say that we blundered, and I know a lot of you are going to want to move to Chicago to play in our chouette tomorrow, <laughs> but I was I was watching uh, Mochi. I watched all the top players blunder all the time. It happens. Backgammon is just not that easy, and nobody goes through the game without some blunders and mistakes. So what I did in this position was it doesn't matter what you do. If you don't make the four point, you're making a real mistake, and that was the mistake that I made, the right play. Of course, is to make the four point. Uh, I made a, a, a really bad play by uh, not making the four point, and it doesn't matter which play I made. I'm not even sure which one. They're all monster blunders. Uh, it looked to me like I was trying to contain them. I was really uh, thinking that making the bar point might be better, but the four point is really clear here. Stick any comments and why it's so important? Yeah, so I would have never considered not making the four point. Those are my first forced two. Uh, deuces were making the four point. Then I had a lot of other options still. The the problem with making the bar point is just the shots. I mean, the guy's got a four point board and you're leaving 11 shots and obviously two five and two six are good. Um, it, it's, you just can't leave those shots when the board's that strong. So that was out for me right away. After I made the four point, then I gave a quick look at the fifth count and then I got rid of 18, 16 just because of how far we're behind. So even though it's the second best play, that was also the second play I eliminated. Um, so it came down to, well, switching I looked at pretty quickly, but again, switching doesn't really work. One, he's favored to come in, and two, when he comes in, even when he fans, you still don't have anything. It's not like he fans and you have a cube. You're still way too light up front and still behind in the race. So switching wasn't strong enough to be a contender in my mind either. So the two I really why considered. Is, why is 9-5 to five so bad? 9-5 to five is what a couple of other players thought they should would have right. done. So it came down to the last two, and the issue with nine to five is basically you're giving up uh, a lot more on his fives. Like if you play nine to five, and he rolls, uh, I feel like if he rolls five four, five three, I feel like you're giving up more. Um, even five two, obviously he gets away, but otherwise he hits. You're also not having the builders for the bar point. It's only a few rolls, but it's four rolls. You know, you got four two, two two, four four now that make the bar point and the complete prime uh, next turn, assuming he's still there. Mm. And no yeah, five really gets away. So this is a lot about game plan too. You're down in the race. Your best game plan is to prime that checker 
and your best way to prime that checker is to leave the checker on the nine point so you can make the bar. Once you make the bar, if you make a six point prime, this game is over. Yeah. And also, some people get to this type of play and they do want to prime or attack. You know, they want to go one way or the other. And here we kind of leave both options open. Like, just because we don't attack now doesn't mean next turn we don't roll a seven and attack, for example, depending on what goes on between now and then. You know, you could still go both ways. It's four points, main point. And then again, eliminating the other. Uh, it's something I do often. I and eliminating plays that the no play is. I figure out what the wrong plays are, and then you, then you're only left with one. Okay, let's go on. Let's, uh, I'm a little embarrassed about this one because it was such a big blunder, but <laughs> it wasn't the worst blunder of the day by far. So I can live with it. Okay, red to play two one. Uh, again, money game. The cube has been turned. Blue's holding the cube. Uh, by the way, this was a shoot. And for those of you who aren't familiar, we have one person playing against the rest. But when we had six players, it was two against four. And after the cube is turned, it's consulting. So when there's consulting, you have lots and lots of discussion and arguments and lots of bets. And that's why we take so many pictures. Okay, think about how you would play a two-one here. And um, again, pause the video if you want. I'm not going to hold this up for the people that make quick decisions. I'll give you a couple seconds. Well, almost everybody agreed that you got to hit here. Put the second checker up. The question is, do you continue? Do you not continue? What do you do after you hit? Stick? Well, good. I'm glad. I was worried that people weren't hitting here. So as long as you hit here, you see it's not really a big deal, and especially if you don't hit and lift, because hitting and lifting is, is pretty ugly when you've, you know, you've got the stronger board. He's already got an anchor that you're going to have to bear in against. So any of the hitting plays are fine, really. Um, as far as deciding between the rest of them, I want to play 6-5 because I don't see any point to 6-5. Like, it's just pushing a builder deeper, generally giving you less covers. So that play was out. Um, you want to keep your 6s and your 5s diversified, which is, I think, what just keeping the checker on the 10-point does. It gives you 6s to cover the 4-point and 5s to cover the ace point. Whereas if you were to push that checker to the 9-point, you'd give yourself 5s and 5s. Um, so that well, the, the, play, the play made over the board was the was the pick and pass, hit and lift, because yeah. he was afraid of leaving two shots. No, uh, you, you can't do that when you've got to bear off against that anchor eventually. It's just that dilly builder, even though it can go to the ace point, that means you put two guys out of play on the ace point. To me, when I look at a position like this, when you're leaving the double shots, you don't care if the guy on the ace point is hit, really. You care about getting hit with a four, not with an ace. If you could exchange, hey, he hits me with an ace, and I come in, I get to cover the four point, you would do that every day of the week. So uh -huh. I don't worry about the two blots. It's only the one that I really care about, the, the guy on the Okay, team. if Blue had a four-point board... Uh, yeah, now we're... Yeah, now board, I'm, yeah. yeah, of course. Well, with a four-point board, how cool you say, of course. What about a three-point board? Would you pick uh, a bad depends on how good the three-point board is. If you just make his four point, yeah, I probably still pick and pass. If you I take two you. from the six and put it on the four. Okay, so what we're saying is, even if you get hit on the ace point, you are going to come in very often and still make your four point by leaving it there. And once you make the four point, you've got a hell of a game. And if you if you continue, you have no chance of making that four point. So uh, you're always going to have this hole here, and it's going to be a real liability going forward. Yeah. Okay. Next position. Red to play three one. Give it a little thought. Pause it if you want. Okay. The right play is the hit, and over the board, the player uh, cleared the eight point. So what's wrong with clearing the eight point? Why is hitting so right here? One problem that I had with the hit was that you're outboarded. Blue has a stronger board. Stick. Looks like I lost you. Sorry, you cut out there for a second. What was the last thing you said? Yeah, I said uh, the player over the board cleared the eight point instead of hitting. And one of the reasons he was afraid to hit was because Blue has a stronger board. Didn't want to be in a hitting situation when you're outboarded. So why is hitting right here? Yeah, and this is, a, this is a tougher play. Again, narrowing it down to the two plays, 
the two real candidate plays is always the first step because usually that keeps your option, you know, your, your error is small. And it's not a big error here. Um, what I think it is overall, it's hard to get a sense of it, but it's just that structure that you keep by hitting loose is so much stronger than if you clear the eight ball. Like if you look at the finished product, like like show the final. I can't, uh, I can't on this. These oh, you can't. Sorry, okay. Yeah. Well, oh, you set this up over the board, you'll see that the eight point being open, it, it, uh, it allows blue just to escape with fours, fives, and sixes. Like it lets him out very easily. Whereas if you just hit loose, the only thing he really has to escape with is, th is uh, sixes now. So it's just that, that priming structure I think is a lot, a lot stronger. So yeah, you're outboarded. And, and generally you don't like to hit when it hurts so bad to get hit. Um, but it really compromises your structure for the rest of the game if you do so. And one of the reasons that structure is so important here is blue is stripped on the rest of his points. So if he can't escape these checkers, what's going to happen over here is he's going to ha get into real trouble having to give up one of these points or possibly leave blots on this side of the board. So, th so it isn't just about what's happening over here. Yeah. Just containing these checkers puts him into big, big trouble over here. Okay. Uh, this is a cube action problem. Cube's in the center. Red is on the bar, but red is on roll. Should red double here? And if red doubles, should blue take or pass? So give it some thought. Pause it if you like. Okay, I hope you have your answer. If not, go ahead and pause the video and give yourself more time. It's pretty hard to double when you're on the bar, but Everybody did double this, and we actually got a couple passes. <laughs> so we're way, I mean, this is one of the super duper blunders, but this, I, this is one of the things a lot of people say, you shouldn't penalize the guy who doubled this if he gets a pass. <laughs> but, but, but Extreme Gammon is assuming that the other player plays right, but this is not even a double. You can see why somebody might pass this cube. It looks like Blue is gonna be in big trouble if he doesn't roll some twos real soon, and it could start crashing. And I was one of the people that doubled this, and I was happy to get the uh, I, I, I was happy to get the, the, the passes. Stick. All right, I got to be honest. This was the e probably the easiest prop of the bunch for me. <laughs> to me, there's just yeah. not even there's hardly any market loss available here. Like I looked at this problem. Let's assume red comes in with a normal number. You know, one x, two x. I don't care which one comes in, brings a guy down from the midpoint. Blue can either throw a two and step up, he could make the bar with a few numbers, he might hit, he might even roll nothing, and it's still going to be a take next turn. So, I mean, for me, I just knew that. So this was, I didn't have to do anything with this problem. This is just obvious to me. Okay. It's, but, it, it's very but, easy to keep red occupied while blue throws a deuce. I mean, blue throws one, two, and he's as happy as all, uh, all can be. Because red has nothing in the zone to harass him. Um, and he can just continue the attack against that lone red checker if he does come in. So blue is favored to roll a two in the next couple of rolls. He's going to roll a two uh, about 30% of the time. And in two or three rolls, he's going to be a big favorite to roll a two. And what you're saying is at the most, if red's lucky, he'll have maybe one or two checkers that might be able to cause him problems even after he rolls the two. So there's just a lot of game left here that, that we just didn't realize. Yeah. This is an interesting number here. What this 16.3% means is that if you can get a pass 16% of the time, you're more than making up for your .146 error by giving the cube. So from a reality standpoint, playing human beings, this is not a bad double because we already proved we got passes a lot more than 16% here. So that's, yeah. that's part of the game. And that's part of why I like Woolsey's Law so much. When you put yourself in your opponent's shoes and you ask yourself, are you taking? Well, Stick's grabbing this cube without any hesitation. A lot of other people might not grab it so fast. He might be a little scared. And that might be a reason to double, but it's pretty hard to justify this big a mistake, even when you get passes. Okay, Red has a 6-1 to play here. Lots of different plays. Give yourself plenty of time. Think about what you would do. What I love about Chouettes is anytime you have more than two choices, uh, 
you get a lot of arguing, <laughs> and we had we had a lot of fun with these these kinds of positions. Okay, the right play is to hit and make the ace point, and of course the plays were, that were discussed were making the bar point or hitting outside or hitting two. All of those plays were considered, uh, and the right play I believe was made, but there was a bet lost on this one. Stick. All right. So this was again. One, this was also a very easy one for me. I would like to hit on the 12 point, but there's simply no good six. I mean, hitting another checker is is way too many shots in an attack you can't follow up. It's a, it's just way too loose. And again, coming to the bar or picking the it, picking it up is either too loose or just too stacked. So uh, since if there's this no checker on the 23, if this checker on the 23 was on the 22, would you come out with the six and hit the 12? Yeah. Yeah, I would, yeah. So the argument that was made over the board is, hey, we get a second checker back, you get a lot more gammons, and it's easier to contain two checkers, and you're passing up the chance to get that second checker when you make this play. Well, the truth is, 25% of the time, after you hit and make the point, he's dancing. So you still might get that second checker, uh, and you, you haven't totally given that up. Right, and also don't forget it's more than 25% because he can... He can enter with a 3-1 or a 5-1, and that checker doesn't go anywhere. Ah, that's right. That's right. Good point. Good point. Okay, let's go to the next one. This is another cube action. Red's on roll, uh, and red is holding the cube, so it's a re-cube action. Should red redouble, and if red redoubles in blue, should blue take her pass? All right, we're going to move on to the answer. It is not a redouble. And again, we all redoubled this. And I think we I think we got uh, a takes. In fact, I'm sure we took. In fact, Herb was, Herb, Herb was the one who was doubled in the box. And he did take this cube. And some doubted his take. And we were shocked to find out we didn't even have a double. Yeah, this one, so unlike the one we looked at before where you said, you know, you got a drop or two drops or something, so everyone doubled. I wanted to have actually doubled that in a shoe because I couldn't see anyone dropping it. I couldn't imagine anyone dropping that cube. It was just so obvious to me. This, however, I could imagine people dropping, so I would have doubled this also, because even if it wasn't a double, it seems like people would just plunk this uh, without too much hesitancy. Um, this is a good one to look at, because depending on where you put Red's checkers, like, if you anchor up red on the four point, it's going to be a double. Whereas if you escape his checker on the 21 point, just to the 16 point, now it's already going to be a pass. Um, those two guys, both behind the prime, or are big time counterplay, obviously, for. Uh, okay, so this is a game that I don't think you can possibly understand unless you play it out or played a lot of backgammon and you realize how often blue will anchor with a five and you realize how often red gets has trouble getting out and the combination of those two things is what makes this a huge take and no double but most people looking at this might say you know if most people tend to look at the glass as half empty if you're blue here you can imagine yourself never coming in you can imagine yourself red uh making the five point or picking and passing on the five point bringing his checkers out and you're going to get gammon the monstrous percentage of the time and if you only look at the glass as half empty and you look at it that way you shouldn't play back if you're going to be a pessimist you got to and you can't be an optimist either you got to be a realist so, yeah that's that's why you got to play these positions out and see that blue ends up anchoring quite a bit and if he anchors, he has a pretty decent chance to win. And at the very least, even if he doesn't win, you don't get gambling that much after you anchor. Okay. Uh, another cube action problem. This is an initial cube, uh, red on roll. And uh, everybody got this one wrong, so <laughs> think a little bit about what you would do here. Uh, if you're red, would you double? If you're blue, would you take or pass? Okay. Correct answer. It's a pass, a big pass, and we we were smart enough to double, and I was on the doubling side, and when the guy took, I thought he was, I, I didn't think he was making a horrible mistake taking. We were surprised, and the answer really is in the numbers. The major reason it's a pass is these gamins are monstrous. Uh, stick, leave it to you. Yeah. I mean, 
three blots, a 25 hip racing deficit, a four point board versus no board. I, I, I dropped this in a heartbeat. I was wondering what went on over the board. Uh-huh. Well, the thinking was if he doesn't roll a two and doesn't hit this checker, or even if he hits this checker, or a one, or, or, or a ten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So if he doesn't right. roll a one, a two, a nine, or a ten, then you're still losing. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, but like I say, ones, twos, nines, and tens are duplicated. <laughs> okay, so we'll go on. This is just a, a blunder, and just it was a, maybe a you'll bad, miss bad with take. Four, six, six, and you'll get lucky. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, but by yeah. the way, this is one of the few times that the player got punished for taking. He got gammon, um, yeah. and, and as he should have, for, yeah. he should have been punished. Quite often, you don't get punished for the wrong play. And I should, but it works out just the opposite. But it's nice once in a while to see that it does work. Okay, number eight is another cube action problem. This is a redouble. Red's holding the cube, uh, and uh, should blue take or pass? If you were red, would you double? And if you were blue, would you take or pass? Well, I'm very proud of this one because I was blue, and I took, and I was severely, very chastised for it. That's why I took a picture, and it turns out that it was a big take, and I was the only taker, and everybody else passed, uh, and I was convinced it was a take. Uh, and... Uh, Nick, I'll let you explain why I was so right to take this cube. <laughs> here's, here's what Phil was thinking over the board. First, what Phil did is started with the race count. And he, he, he thought, hey, if this is a straight race, would I have it take as blue? So Phil used the Keith count, and he probably figured out he... So if we use the Keith count, what are we going to have? Um, 5, 6, 81, 11, we'll have 92 to 88. So it would be a redouble and a take according to the Keith count. Um, but a clear take, a take by by uh, an, an extra pip. So if it were a straight race, we have, we have a take. So what Phil then asked himself, well, if I roll a one, you know, those 11 games, how often is blue going to win from there? Because if we take out the other 25 games, that we said it's just a straight race. And we said that blue won, you know, at least, you know, blue won basically a fourth of those because we said he had to take by a pip, so he basically won one out of four of those. So he's going to win six to seven games out of those 25. All he needs to win is two or three games after getting hit for this to be a take, really. Um, so after getting hit in those 11 games, does he win two out of ten times? I think he for sure does, and I would have taken like so. Yeah, and by the way, Stick mentioned the Keith count. I teach the Keith count to every one of my students, and uh, there's been some adjustments using the eyesight formula and some other uh, approaches, but the Keith count has been a real savior for me because before I learned the Keith count, I would have thought that red was up by 11 pips. But if you look at the wastage, if you learn the Keith count, there's a lot more wastage on red side of the board. These 11 pips is not really true. So what Stick did is he added wastage. There's two pips of wastage for every checker more than one on the ace point. There's a, so there's four pips of wastage here. There's a pip of wastage for this extra checker, and there's a pip of wastage for the open five point. Now, the Keith count doesn't penalize you for having too many checkers on the six point, but we sure all know that's not a pretty thing to have in your bear off. On the other side of the, of the street, Blue's only got two pips of wastage for these two extra checkers in the two point. So this 11 uh, pip count is not really as bad as it looked. And I realized that. I wasn't losing the race by that much. So I realized that if I didn't get hit, I've got a pretty darn good race. Plus, I know that holding the cube in a race, and John O'Hagan taught me this one, another one of our teaching partners, I get an extra about 18% cube jig, or about one-sixth of my winning chances are, are increased because I'm holding the cube in a race. So if I get lucky and don't get hit here, I, I'm in really great shape in this race holding the cube. It's almost an even game. Not quite, but I'm holding the cube in almost an even game. That's a great place to be. And if I get hit, I'll, like Sticks says, I'll still win some of those. So I'm very proud of, of this take, and I, I do credit the Keith count as a big part of the reason that I, that I took. It wasn't just about the shots. Okay. Uh, this is another cube action problem and another redouble. Uh, red is on roll. Uh, should red redouble? Uh, and if red redoubles, should blue take or pass? Well, let's let's just 
finish that part of it right now. There's no question that blue passes this cube. The real question is, is red too good to redouble or not? That's really the question. Should you play on for the gammon? And uh, we'll see. The, the, the player who was playing this made the mistake of doing the wrong thing. Would you, would you play on for the gammon here, or would you uh, double blue out is the question. Okay. The answer is it's way too good to double. Uh, and Stick, you want to explain why? Yeah, the simplest explanation I have is let's say red rolls one of his worst numbers, which is going to be, you know, 5 1, a 6 1, something like that. Something leaves a shot. And then blue hits and, like, goes to the outfield. Red can still cube him out from the root. Because blue has no board. Blue can't contain red, and he's going to have five checkers off. So when the worst happens, you can just double the guy out, so there's no point in not playing on. Because um, mm -hmm. blue's board's just so bad. If you make blue's board... Sorry. Mm -hmm. If you make blue's oh. board stronger and stronger, you should... You should look at this to figure out where you're supposed to keep playing on, because as long as that six point is open, you often play on in times like this, because it doesn't necessarily mean you can double him out since the six point is open, but since the six point is open, you can always have the threat of coming in and being right back in it. So even here, I think if you give him a five point board, if the six is open, it's still going to be too good. Whereas if you give him a five point board with like the ace open, it's not going to be too good. Uh -huh. So the theory of whether or not you're too good or not uh, used to be you, wait, you, you measure the, your chances of losing against your chances of winning a gamut. But what Stick is pointing out is there's really something else involved. It's whether or not your opponent has a market gainer. If on the next roll, he can be in a position where he would take. And if the answer is no, in most situations, uh, compared to a bunch of gamuts that you might win, then you should always be playing on. Now, in the situation where the six point would be open, yes, he might have a take if he hits you and the six point is open. And that's a market gainer, but still for that to happen, uh, you're still favored to win the game, and for that to happen, you still have to roll one of those bad rolls, and he has to hit it. The odds of that are not that great. Now, the roll before this, red, blue was on the ace point with two checkers, and red had a 3-4 to play, and peeled the two checkers off of the 4-point and 3-point, as opposed to clearing the 6-point. Do you have an opinion on which play was right there, Stick? I'm good with peeling. Yeah, and that's exactly what happened. And, uh, and the player did peel, and several people said, no, nah, if you had to clear the six point, you wouldn't be in this spot now. But if you, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you did that, though, you wouldn't have two more checkers off. <laughs> yeah. and, you still, and you still have a chance to leave a shot if you clear the six point. Uh, so, uh, so clearing is, was the best play. Okay. Let's go on. No, no. Was, was ripping two checkers off the best play or clearing? Ripping is much, was much better. Okay. Was just, the opposite. You were right. You, yeah. Oh, you were right. If you have two yeah. checkers here and he had the ace point, ripping yeah. was much better, which is what the player did. But then, then yeah. he got to this position and chicken and, and went ahead and doubled. So he had the guts to he had the guts to go big and then lost lost his lost his guts. Of course, keeping the box is big in our shoe, as you can tell. <laughs> we do a lot of we do a lot of wrong things to keep the box, and it's probably cost. Probably the number one thing that's cost money in our shoe is people doing things to keep the box. <laughs> okay, so uh, here we have another cube action problem. Again, red is on roll. It's the initial cube. If you're red, do you double? If you're blue, do you take or pass? Okay. The answer is it's not a double. And uh, it, we did double, and we did have a pass. So... This was a great blunder to make, to be the doubler, and a horrible mistake to pass this cube. Stick any comments? Yeah, again, I, I just don't see the market loss when I see one of these positions. It, it's got to be some spectacular roll, like, you know, a 1-1 one, one or a 4-4 four, four or a 6-6. Six, six. There's just not many general rolls that lose your market, and you're not going to have enough. You know, if you don't have a lot of market loss, you can't have a double. The guy's got an anchor, albeit not a good one, but you don't have anyone in the zone. You gave up the eight point. You don't have the seven point. So he can see daylight for days to come. Um, 
Yeah, and, and, and this number right here is pretty important that Blue only gets gammoned about 22%. But keep in mind, if he wins this game, he wins 9% gammon, so his net gammon losses are pretty small. It's only 11%. And gammon fear is one of the major reasons in a shoeette that people drop cubes. So the player who dropped this cube was, I'm sure, thinking that he could get gammon a lot in this game, a lot more than he than it looks like. Yeah, a lot of game left. A lot of game left here. Okay, red to play six five. I'll save you some time. There's obviously two choices. There's breaking the thirteen point, bringing two checkers down for builders, or there's pointing on the two point. And of course, the reason I'm showing you this is that the player made the wrong play. Which and play like did you so make? Like Phil said, there are two plays, bringing two down from the midpoint or hitting loose on the four point. <laughs> <laughs> Just like you yeah. said. Wow. You know what? Nobody even mentioned that. That might be better than the play that was made. <laughs> that might be the second best play. <laughs> Could be. So which play do you make? All right. Let me show you the answer. The answer is bring the two down. Now, the reason that the player pointed, and he explained it, and he got away with it, by the way, was he, not only did he think he could win more gammons and blitz more and gain more time, but, it, it, but he also uh, was afraid of giving Blue his full roll by not hitting, because if Blue rolls a two and he anchors, he's afraid of that, or he's afraid of getting hit off the ace point, and, and this whole idea of taking away half his roll was one of the major motivations. So what's wrong with the, the pointing play, Stick? That's way too many shots when Blue's board is that strong. Um, I don't know how many shots that is. It, it looks like, what, what is that going to be? It looks like it's going to be almost a single shot if you make uh -huh. the two. And that's way too many shots with, with three blocks against the uh, you know, four point, best four-point board and a five-point prime. And you, you don't need a tempo play here. You're not stopping Blue from doing much of anything. Yeah, he might run a checker. Yeah, he might roll a deuce. That deuce has to come with something, though. And the other half of the roll doesn't play anymore. Uh -huh. Does the so, fact that Red's holding the cube here have any bearing on this play? If the cube were on the other side, would it, would it matter? No, and I'm going to say that just in general because people think it's rare that that makes a difference. It does every... You know, a very rare occasion, but usually the right play is just the right play. Uh, so, uh, no, I, I was thinking the cube might have an effect because if you make the correct play here and blue doesn't roll a two and doesn't do something good, uh, you might be getting closer to a redouble, but I guess you still have some work to do because of that checker back on the ace point. Yeah, I guess so. if, the, yeah, if Red's checker was on the two point, it would be a, a, far, a far bigger game for Red. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's move on. Number 12. Uh, this, again, is a recube problem. Red is on the bar and thinking about redoubling. If he does redouble, does Blue take her pass, and should Red redouble or not? What do you think? Okay, the answer is it is a redouble, and it is a big take. And, uh, Stick, I'll let you... Take it from here. Yep, one sec. All right, so a few things. Um, first, what's important in this kind of uh, position is the opponent spares, blues spares. The fact that he doesn't have any on the top point is, is a pretty big deal, and that's whether he's crunching with a four-point board or a five-point board or whatever. When the top point is void of a spare, that means he's usually going to have numbers that leave an extra blot, which, you know, would probably lose your market. You know, if he rolls a 6-3 or a 5-3 or a 4-3 here, guess what? He has to leave a blot. It also obviously means he's not going to hold a four-point board that way. So the positioning of those spares is, is hugely important, and that's one of the first things that I zone in on when I see this kind of position. Um, another thing I want to mention before I forget it is XG in general underestimates how often the person on roll wins this type of position. So if you went through the different flies, I bet it would get less and less of a take. And I'm sure um, that it isn't as big of a take as it says it is uh, if we did a full rollout. 
It just well, let's, on that subject. That uh, on that subject, yeah. I was very upset with XG giving me a horrible blunder on a containment play in Chicago, where it said I made a point two nine four error, <laughs> and when I rolled it out using gigantic five ply, it turned out that the other play was a point two something error. So, <laughs> so. Uh, but it, but I, by the way, it took me eight hours to do a gigantic five-ply rollout. Um, uh, it was a five-ply. Now I'm doing right now. I'm sorry. It was a four-ply. It was a four-ply uh, gigantic rollout. Now I'm doing gigantic uh, five-ply uh, XGR plus plus, and it's going to take me eight days. Uh, and I'm doing it. I'm doing it on my spare computer uh, so that it doesn't tie up my. My, my RAM on, on, my, on my computer. So what Stick is saying is we do know there are certain types of positions that XG is entirely good with, and knowing which kinds of positions those are is key to helping you your game. And I had no idea this is one of the ones that XG doesn't get right or doesn't get yeah, I mean, it, accurate. it gets it decent, but it doesn't, again, it, it underestimates the person the person mm -hmm. on it. So. Yeah, but in, but in containment and back games, it might even give you the wrong play by a mile. Uh, so right. You, so you really have to. You really. You, we still don't have a bot that's perfect uh, yet. We, we're getting there. This is as good as it comes as we've gotten before. But we still got work to do. Now the the blunder that was made here was pass. Uh, it, this was pass. And the player. Why why should you take this cube? Well, the very first thing I see if I'm blue is that I'm not going to get gamut very much. If red is successful, unless he gets another checker and closes me out, that's like about three percent gamut. So I learned a long time ago that if I'm not going to get gammon too much in a money game, it usually doesn't cost me that much to take cues that I think might be a take. So that's that's pretty much my benchmark. I didn't know, there's no way in the world I would have known that I win this game 24% of the time. I, I just don't know how to come up with that number, and I don't think very many people could unless they already had looked at a lot of positions and did it from a standpoint of having it as a reference. I mean, how good would you have been at estimating wins here, Stick? Could you have come close to 24%? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, yeah. You know, I, 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 know I wasn't terrific. happy taking, so I would have been in the, somewhere between the 20 and 25 range, but I don't know. Okay, yeah. So there are positions where I bet you, I would bet anything that Stick could come within 1%. There are positions where I bet I could come within 2%. This isn't one of them. So I had no idea how much Blue would win this game, but I just felt like, since I don't know, it might be a take, it might be a pass, but if I pass, at least I'm, I mean, if I take, I'm just not going to get gammon that much. So I use Wolsey's Law as red here. Since I think Blue might pass, that's the major reason I'm doubling here, because I might get a pass. I didn't know if it was a take or not myself. But... The, the, the blunder was the, the pass. Why is this a take? Why, would, would, do you see enough light at the end of this tunnel to take this cube stick? I, I had a tough time with this, whether I want to take it or not. Again, one of the first things, if I had a spare on the four point, I was absolutely taking and maybe not even double as red. Mm -hmm. Blue had a spare on his four point. I mean, it's just such a huge difference here. I, I, I honestly didn't know what I would do. Um, if I'm playing an issue at, maybe I would even base it on the guy playing the checkers, if he could possibly uh -huh. screw something. But so it's blue play something. <laughs> this, is, this is one of the biggest advantages I think I, I, I've had uh, in becoming a teacher and having to work with people like Stick and John Hagen and Perry and, and Mochi and Michi are on our team now. Dmitry Obukov uh, just joined us, our Russian teacher. Working with these people, I've learned uh, strategies for understanding positions better and, and across the board every one of them will point out variations they won't just look at this position and say why this is a take or pass but they'll test it if we took if we had the time i would put this position in xg and move a checker to the four point and see, just see how big a take it would be and maybe it wouldn't be a double so looking at the variations is the way you you really get to understand and remember these things okay let's go to the next one number 13 uh, notice that red does have a checker off. It's a bear off question. The cube has already been turned. You have a 5-2, and of course the question is whether you clear the 6-point or clear the 5-point. Clearing the 5-point gets an extra checker off, which will win you more gammons, but it's a little bit riskier in terms of leaving shots. Is it worth it? And this is a hard one for me. Uh, I really, there, you know, when you obviously are going to win a gammon, you don't take the chances. When there's no chance to win a gammon, you don't take the chance. It's these in-betweeners where the gammons are not sure 
is where it's hard to know when to take the chance or not. So first of all, decide whether or not you would take off an extra checker, and in which case you would leave a shot with a 6-1 or a 5-1, or you would play safe and nothing leaves a shot that you don't get another checker off. So give it some thought, and then I'm going to ask Dick to tell me how he makes these decisions. Okay, the answer is you play safe here. Stick, how do you know when you're supposed to gamble? The first thing I'll tell everyone is to heavily, heavily, heavily lean towards the double match point play in these situations. And and that that right here is, is obviously clearing from the back and never leaving any shots. Um, so if you're ever just in doubt, you're not sure, definitely make the DMP play, you know, the safest not leaving any shots kind of play. Um, the things you're going to want to look at in general, there aren't is the guy's board strength. Obviously, like Phil said, if you're already winning a gammon, like if a gammon's a sure thing, you play safe. Also, if a gammon is very unlikely, you play safe. Um, here, when we lift up the five point, two bad things happen. One is it's a lot of shots. Like it's not just two numbers. It's not just four numbers. It's like seven numbers that leave a shot. Um, so that's a lot of numbers that leave a shot to begin with. And the second thing is, yes, you get off a checker, but you also have a much slower bear off. So it's not like you really get off a checker because your bear off having the gap five is much slower now. How are you ever going to clear the six and take two checkers off? It, it's not going to usually happen. You're going to probably waste somewhere along the way anyway. So it's not really that much faster of a bear off. Uh, very good point. Very good point. Now, there's another uh, thing, and I think I heard this from Stick first, but I've heard it from a bunch of, from a few people since, and that is something that's very important, and this, uh, this goes along with what Stick is saying about making the DMP play. You cannot win a gammon any game that you lose, and you can't lose a gammon any game that you win. So when you make the DMP play, by virtue of the fact that you're more likely to win the game, you're also more likely to win the gammon. So by playing six, you might win as many or more gammons anyway just because you prevented the loss. So that's one of the major things to think about on these DMP plays. Now, if you made the gammons a little bit closer, if you made Blue's board worse, uh, if he had the open five point, for example, and maybe two blots in his board, and maybe it wasn't so clear that you'd make you win gammon so easily, then you'd have a very strong reason to gamble and take off the five point here. At what point do you swing it? Uh, there's too many variables to give you a, a flat answer. You have to really. That's why. That's why I think this is, these are hard. This one wasn't hard. This one should have been a no brainer, and, and this one was blundered by uh, one of our very very good players. And I won't say who because all of our players are pretty good. But it was a, it was a blunder, and and, uh, uh, and we're learning our lesson. Okay, let's go. We got two more. Uh, this is a cube action problem. Red is on roll. This is a pure racing situation. It shouldn't be that hard uh, with some kind of formulas or some science to figure out what the cube action is here. Should red double? And if red double, should blue take or pass? So before I show you the answer, stick, do you use Ward, Kleinman, Trice, uh, Stack and Straggler, Keith Count, uh, EPC? What the hell do you use here to decide about the cube action? Well, what you use everything you have available to you. In other words, I almost always start with the Keith Count, even though upon sight of this, I know this is not Keith Count friendly because of the excess wasted blue and because of the extra crossovers. I still can, mm -hmm. I still start with that though. I mean, why wouldn't you? Just to give you an idea. And then after that, I would go on. My next favorite is the EPC, and this is pretty easy for me to estimate the effective tip count on. And that seems like it'd be a lot more reasonable in this position than that. Um, uh -huh. So, I have, you have come I, up with the right cube action here? No, I would have gotten the all the formulas get it wrong, so I probably would have been screwed. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're honest. That's nice to hear. So. Yeah. This is a this is a pass, and it's pretty hard for people to imagine that when you're only losing by two pips, you should pass. And again, if you use the Keith count, you'll see that blue has tremendous wastage, 
Uh, he has all these extra checkers on the two point, and this is not a pretty position, and he has two extra crossovers. Now, the keep count doesn't deal with crossovers, and that's why John O'Hagan and I have decided when we teach the keep count, we also add crossovers to that keep count. We don't, we haven't switched to the eyesight method, but we have pretty much stayed with keep count, but we do add something for crossovers. Eyesight uh, gets is, this wrong too. <laughs> I think it's wrong too. Okay, yeah. they all get it wrong. Okay, yeah. so uh, does, it, does, it, does EPC get it right? No, no. Okay, so nothing gets this right, and uh, <laughs> so I can't blame the player over the board who took this cube for getting it wrong. Uh, that he had to take, and it wasn't a horrible mistake. It was only a point oh five four error uh, to take the cube. By the way, I was criticized not too long ago by saying this is a five point four percent error. This is not a 5.4% error. That's not what 0.054 means. What does it mean, Stick? Um, it depends how you want to express it. I would, it, it gives up a 20th of a point. You could put it that way. <laughs> um, okay. it, it depends but, what you, it, that's, it gives up 0.054 in equity. So if something gives up 0.1 in equity, it's a 10th of a point or a 10th of what you're playing for. So if you're playing for hundreds, you just gave up 10 bucks. Um, that's well, if you're equation. playing for a dollar a point here, aren't you giving up 5.4 cents? Yes, that's fine. So it is a 5.4% error. What's, what's wrong with my saying it that way? Again, it gets confusing when you uh, apply it to match play. I think. Ah, when, I see. Because okay. if you tell me I gave up 5% on a play, I really didn't give up 5% in a play. Okay. So, so Again, for, for money not, play, it's not really confusing. It's just not completely accurate. I mean, everyone understands I, it. It's not a big deal to use okay. it. I got you. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's go on. Last one. Uh, this is another cube action problem. Cube is in the center. Red is on roll. Should red double? And if red double, should blue take or pass? Let's see if everybody can get this last one right. Because we sure didn't get it right over the board. Okay, the answer is, it's a double and a take. And several people thought this was a pass, and several people thought this wasn't a double. We were wrong on both sides. <laughs> Stick with your analysis of this one. Well, the doubling side, I mean, I thought both sides are relatively easy, but the doubling side, again, we can use, I love O'Hagan's Law. Um, the only restrictions O'Hagan's Law has is that the player has to know what a market losing sequence is. Um, mm -hmm. So here is red. Again, we have a decent-sized racing lead, so we can imagine that even something lame like 4-5 or 6-3 are going to be, for the most part, market losers the entire time because blue is going to come in, be down, you know, still 15 pips in the race and have a guy trapped. So that's four of them. And then we've got almost like 4 3 and 3-3 three, three and double fours. So we only need to get up to nine market losing sequences to have a cube and honestly i could see that here very quickly um just imagine you know the ones that make the primer escape the checker or when he just fans next turn too obviously it's probably going to be pass <laughs> no matter what uh -huh. we roll if he fans again it's probably going to be a pass uh -huh. so it's easy to pick out the market losing sequences and we're doing okay on all the other rolls which you have to be doing in O'Hagan's, and it's a center cube so we're, we're good there um as for the take, again, red's checker all the way back with blues, the strength of blues board is a big, I mean, that's that's what stands out to me is the strength of blues board. Uh, obviously that he's favored big time to come in next turn. And then since red's checker is back that far, we're gonna have uh, just a lot of counterplay against that. Okay, just uh, for clarification, Oh, John O'Hagan came up with a theory uh, of market losers. It was one of the first things I learned from John, and it, I teach it to everybody. Uh, what you what you do is you start out with Woolsey's Law. We still believe firmly in asking yourself if your opponent has a take. And in this position, if you aren't sure if your opponent has a take, you don't have to go any further. It's a double anytime you're not sure if he has a take or if you think he has a pass. But if you think he has a take, which is the correct thought here, because he does have a clear take. Then, if you, uh, oh, John O'Hagan's law says that if you think you will lose your market about 25% of the time net, which is nine out of 36 rolls, which is what Stick did. He came up with nine out of 36. Uh, that means on the next roll, 
<clears throat> uh, after 25% of your roles followed by his roles, he's probably dropping, then you should give the cue. That's assuming that the other roles, the other 27 roles are not terrible roles that hurt you real bad. <clears throat> and Red doesn't have any roles here that are monster anti-market losers that are terrible roles that would crack his prime or cause him to lose or anything like that. Now, Stitch made another comment that I think was very, very interesting. He said that because Red is stuck back here, uh, Blue's got plenty of game here and plenty of counterplay. I did, I put this position in and I came to the same conclusion and I asked myself, what if Red's checker were on the 18 point? Do you know the answer there, Stick? If Red's checker was on the 18 point? No, it, no. I would, though. I don't know. Pass it? Yeah. Uh, so just moving from here to here, Stick would pass, and he's right by a mile. I just put Stick on the on the spot. It <laughs> went from a point two six take to a point three three pass. Um, it, it, it took a point five swing, uh, <clears throat> which is monstrous. So <clears throat> Stick nailed it. The reason why Blue has a take is this checker right here. And if this checker can get easily get out, Blues hasn't got enough game to take this cube, and it's going to be a big, big pass. So again, I wasn't sure that was the reason, uh, and that, and I played around with some other things. I gave Red uh, more builders to make the five point. Uh, I, I kept the checker back there, and I and I did because I, I really wanted to understand this position better by playing variations. And I found out that if you take these two checkers and you put one on the seven point, one on the six point, that also becomes a monster pass because of now you have so many more numbers that make the five point. And, 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 or if he comes in on the one on the two point or whatever, it just gives you a much better game if these two checkers are not stacked. So it doesn't take too much to move a checker here or there to turn it into a take or a pass. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you think uh, Stick's teaching style or my teaching style is good, well, let me tell you, uh, we, uh, we have very different styles, but we, all, we both teach exactly the same kinds of things. Uh, often to different levels of students. As soon as I get a student that goes through the basics and, and is a you know, strong intermediate player, I turn them over to Stick or John or, or Dennis Culpepper or Perry or David Presser, one of the higher level teachers. Uh, but we have 16 teachers and uh, now we have uh, eight, eight or nine different languages. I've lost count because we just added Russian and Hebrew this year. Uh, so go to the www.thebackgammonlearningcenter.com if you're interested in lessons. And uh, we will be making an announcement shortly about some uh, a very special new thing we're doing with boot camps. So I will not uh, 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 blow it by telling you all the details, but we're going to have a, a whole new project from the Back Emma Learning Center. Stick, thanks for your help. Thanks for watching. I encourage you all to play Shuettes. It's a great way to learn. It's fun. And if you like to gamble, it's great gambling, too. Talk to you all soon. Bye-bye.